Pray with me, church. Thank you, Lord, for the awesome time we've had already praising you. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you're good and that you're great and your word is powerful. I pray for the man of God, Corey, as he presents your word in his field is what you have burdened his heart with over the last several years. And Lord, as it starts to uh, become reality at the end of this year, I pray that you continue to use him and just guide him and protect him. I pray, Lord, as he presents the word to us today, that, that our hearts would be open and that you would use him to transform our hearts and our lives, that we would be more on fire for you, Jesus, to share your word and to share the gospel with those that don't know you yet. We love you. Thank you for what you're going to do in these moments. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you all in the great state of uh, New Jersey. And this is our first time, my family and I, this is our first time in New Jersey, as a matter of fact. And uh, we've enjoyed our time here. We enjoyed uh, doing the outreach ministry yesterday with the Back to School Bash and uh, what a blessing that was. Uh, but being in New Jersey, we've noticed one thing. And I, I don't know if it's all of New Jersey, but in the area where I specifically, you all have a lot of traffic. <laughs> you all got a lot of traffic. Now, now, now keep in mind, my, my family and I, we grow up in southern Ohio next to Kentucky. Kentucky's the state where toothbrushes were first invented because they only had one tooth, so they have to brush the one tooth. So, we redneck, okay? Uh, I'm trying to use that grammar on purpose to get it across, but, you know, we're, we're redneck. So, we, we introduced in our town a roundabout. Well, roundabouts, you know, those are unheard of in our area of Ohio. So, you know, people are hitting each other all the time with it, and they're thinking, who on earth decided to put this thing in? Why can't we have a red light and green light? Uh, but they, they would not survive in New Jersey with all the traffic is all I have to say. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you all. My name is Corey. Uh, my wife, I'm going to uh, have her come up because I'd like to have her share her testimony this morning with you all because uh, she is vital to this ministry as well. Uh, but her name is Cora, and uh, we have three kiddos. Uh, we have Elena, Eleanor, and Judah, and we are missionaries going to Toronto, Canada. And so before we talk about Toronto and get into God's Word uh, this morning, I'd like for my wife to share her testimony. I believe that uh, one of the best ways you can uh, understand or get to know a brother or sister in Christ is when you hear what they were before, what happened to them when Christ came, and now what they're doing for the Lord as of today. That's one of the best ways you can learn about a brother or sister in Christ. And so I'm going to have my wife talk a few minutes about uh, what God has done in her life concerning uh, salvation and the call to missions. And then we have a video we're going to play that talks about Toronto, uh, what's going on in Toronto, what we are going to experience. And uh, it will give you some good ways uh, to be praying for us. And then afterwards, we will get into God's word this morning. So, Cora, how about you go ahead and share your testimony? So I did not grow up in the picture-perfect Christian household um, like some of you might have. So I did not first start coming to church until I was 15 years old. And it was actually at our sending church right now is where I first started coming to church. And this amazing woman who was my Sunday school teacher just poured into me and poured into me. And um, as she's doing that, I'm retaining all of this information. But I never once trusted Christ as my Savior. And at the age of 16, I don't know, do you all send your teenagers to church camp or anything like that? Yeah, so um, I went to my first church camp experience, and one of the rules is, like, you can't be on your phone. you got to stay connected in God's Word and all these other things. And so I'm hearing all this preaching. I'm listening to it, and God was already working on my heart about salvation and accepting Him as my Savior. But it wasn't until someone asked me, hey, when did you get saved? And then it really became personal because I, I heard about, you know, all of these people and what God, Jesus has done, but I didn't actually think to ask myself that question. You know, I thought about Jesus saves the world, you, you know, he died for everyone, but I didn't think about how he died for me and he loves me and I need to accept him as my savior. And so um, I ended up getting saved when I was 16 years old. 
And a year later, I went back to that same church camp, and this they were preaching on being sent and giving 100% of your life to Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're saved, you can still not be living for God 100%. You might not give him 100% of your heart. And so they talked about how it's important to give 100% of your life to Christ. Whatever it is you're doing, give 100% of it to God. Whatever it is in your life that you're not giving 100%, do it. And so um, I gave 100% of my life to Christ, and I decided whatever it was that you wanted for me, God, that's what I want to do. But I specifically really wanted to do missions. I was like, I think missionaries are superheroes, like kind of like you said, but now I know that they are not superheroes. <laughs> they are just ordinary people. But at that time, I had just met my first missionary, and I was like, wow. They travel around. They tell people about Jesus. They give up everything, their hearts, their desires, their family. They give up everything, and they go and do God's work somewhere that they don't know. And, and so I was like, I want to do that. But in my mind, I thought, and you guys might think this too, but when I think of missions, I thought, I'm going to go to like Africa and I'm going to tell them about Jesus and be with kids and teach them English and, and, you know, tell them about Jesus. And that's what my mind thought about missions. I didn't think that so many years later we would be going to Canada and that God would call us to Canada. And it was kind of a disappointment, like God, they already know about Jesus. Why are you calling us to Canada? They're, they're a first world country. They know about Jesus. Why are we going there? And it was kind of like a setback, like, God, you know, not that I was, I was kind of questioning God. I'm just going to be honest. I'm like, really? Are you serious? But when I started researching and we went to Canada and I saw all of the idolatry and it's the biggest multicultural city in the world. So all of those cultures have brought all of their religions and all of the, all of the Buddhist temples and Islamic and, and the Hindu, like all of that was just so overwhelming to my soul. And that is when I saw a need. Then I saw those people that I just fell in love with because my heart just breaks for their condition that they're in. And I love them, those people. And I think when we stop and we look at the people through Jesus' eyes and we see how much he loves them and what he's done for them, and it just makes you fall in love with them. And you want to go and you want to tell them about Jesus. And so we are excited to go and to live there and to be able to show the people the love of Jesus and tell him about all that he has done for them. And um, I just say thank you. We're really excited to go, and we're going to be leaving um, this year, and we get to go this year, and it's just it's becoming very real, but we are super excited. So thank you for allowing us to come and share our burden for the people in Toronto and for the love that Jesus has for them. Absolutely. Appreciate my wife's heart for uh, lost souls all across the world in general. Um, but I trusted in Christ when I was 14 years old. I grew up in uh, a church setting family. My, uh, my family, we were always in church. Uh, I was drugged to church when I was a baby. <laughs> the, the, the first time I was able to go, I was in church as a newborn. And so uh, growing up, God uh, touched my heart for ministry around the age of 17. And so the best advice I can give to anyone that believes they are called to ministry is pray about it and ask God to open the doors because he'll open the doors. And so for me, I prayed about it. I asked God, you know, I will surrender to what you want me to do. You open the doors and I'm going to follow every step of the way. I'll be faithful in the small things as you continue to give me more responsibility. And that's exactly what the Lord did. So we continued down uh, that path. And it wasn't until when I was a youth pastor in March of 2021 where uh, God touched my heart for missions. And so, of course, uh, I surrendered and my, my family surrendered. And our whole goal in mind was, Lord, we know you want us to go somewhere, uh, but where do you want us to go? And so the way we asked the Lord to do this was, Lord, we need you to reveal it through prayer. We need you to reveal it through life events. But we ultimately need to hear from your holy word because we know that you're going to speak to us through your word. And so we asked the Lord to speak to us in those three ways. And every single time, God continue to press on Toronto, Canada and the need for the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a spiritually deprived 
city. And so with the video that we have to show you all this morning, you're going to see some of the examples of uh, that spiritual uh, depravity for Christ, uh, that they need Christ as their Savior, uh, that the gospel is a whosoever gospel, that anyone can come to know Christ as their Savior because God opens his salvation to all. And so we're going to show that video real quick. We'll talk about it, and then we'll get into God's word. Appreciate everyone in the back today. student in Canada has been arrested for declaring that men and women are different. Josh Alexander attended St. Joseph's High School, Catholic High School in Renfrew, Ontario. He was barred from school from the grounds for saying that God created two genders. That's kind of a Christian precept. available at no cost to women who need it. Good morning to you. Uh, here in Canada, 95% of the cannabis sales are made in the recreational market compared to about 60% in the U.S. That means the overwhelming majority of users, they buy at locations like this Tokyo Smoke Store here in downtown Toronto. Up north, the market's dominated by cannabis flower, a.k.a. pot, a.k.a. weed. And so... Imagine choosing death over homelessness. That's what one St. Catherine's man is contemplating. Tonight on City News, we continue to delve into medically assisted dying and how some believe it is their only option to living in poverty. Are you afraid to die? Who isn't? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh... souls to Christ, to baptize them and disciple them. This is the plan that our brethren in the book of Acts carried out, and it was successful because it was a plan created by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Along with following our Lord's plan, we plan to birth as many churches as possible before the Lord's return. This will create the opportunity for many Canadians to be able to attend Bible-believing Baptist churches. In our discipling, we will be discipling the next generation of pastors, missionaries, evangelists, Sunday school teachers, bus workers, and whatever else God has in store with the intent for them to serve Him in whatever He calls them. Jesus to save me. Yeah, and so, you know, there's there's many people up in Toronto like this that uh, still believe in God and they're still giving their hearts to Jesus. And so this is why it is important for us to get up to Toronto as soon as possible because we want to reach more lives like Riley.
appreciate you all playing the video this morning. Um, I think we all understand pretty well why we uh, make the one second uh, clips toward the end of all the faces around the world because as my wife mentioned, uh, we are the biggest multicultural city in all of the world. And so we have the opportunity to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, to take church planting uh, to a city that has all the nations of the world represented just in one location. It is such an amazing and unique opportunity that we have uh, as missionaries. Uh, but uh, before going further, uh, when we talk about the spiritual darkness, um, obviously with the uh, segment clips of some of the uh, sin that we are going to face up in Toronto, uh, let it be a reminder that uh, the, the folks that we show, it's not for the purpose to bring up anger, anger in our hearts toward the people. The people are precious. The people, as Scripture says, are made in the image of God. The anger is supposed to be towards the sin that's killing them. That's what the anger is supposed to be directed towards. And quite frankly, a lot of us understand this morning that sin is a killer. I cannot begin to get all the stories that I can think of of story after story where sin has torn a family apart, where sin has torn an individual apart, and ultimately they die in their sin and have eternal separation from Christ. And so as missionaries, our goal is to take the story that takes the chains off of them. Our goal is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those lost in the darkness to compel them to the light so that they could be free from their sin. So as, as the song sang, I, I don't remember what the song uh, title was, it, but it talked about the blood of Christ. But towards the end of it, it mentions the word justified. Our goal is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that when they trust in Christ as their Savior, they are justified. Or a better way to remember justified is just as they never sinned. Because when they trust in Jesus as their Savior, when, when the blood, when the blood washes their sin away, God views them just as they never sinned. Why is that? Because the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed towards us. That's what we want to see happen. We want to see those lost in the darkness. We want to see those who are wrapped up in false religion to come to the light, to know Him as Savior, and to have the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that you know what I'm talking about today. And so as missionaries, we, we uh, ask and believe that every church we have the privilege to go to, every brother and sister in Christ uh, that we have been able to meet over the past two years, we believe you can play a vital vital role in making this done. We believe not just in Toronto, but all missionaries across the world that you financially support, that you prayerfully support. Liberty, we believe you play an eternal impact in that, and we believe you can continue to do so locally and globally. And the way you can do that, Liberty, is you could take three ministry actions. And those, that first ministry action is you can pray. You can pray for lost souls in Toronto now. We may not be up there officially permanently right now. We're still trying to get our uh, monthly financial support in order to do this full time in Toronto. Uh, our goal is to be leaving by the end of December after Christmas where we will officially be up there. Uh, but pray for lost souls in Toronto now. Pray that God would begin softening their hearts toward the gospel Pray concerning our visas. Pray concerning moving up there. Pray as we uh, search for a house in, in the months to come in Toronto. That God would orchestrate that perfectly as He always does. That it would be a smooth process. But most importantly, that He'd be glorified. There's other ways you could pray for us as well. But ultimately, we want to say in response as you pray for us, we have already, already committed, even months before, we have already committed to be praying for you all. Being a Christian in America is tough. It is hard. And we know it is. And so as you're praying for us, we're already praying for you all. We don't know the serious needs or decisions that are coming up in your life, but we know they're there. We know there's temptation. We know there's trials and testings coming up in your life. If you're not already in the eye of the storm right now, 
And so we're praying for you all already, praying that God would move in a mighty way in your families and in your life, that you begin uh, continuing to grow closer and closer to Christ, that any decisions uh, coming forward, uh, that God would uh, move in them. As you pray for us, we have already begun praying for you months in advance to this point. We're praying for you all in response. We ask for you to pray. We ask for you to promise. Promise and giving to missions. If you all remember Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul is talking to that amazing church, Philippi, and he says, because you gave to my necessities, you have fruit abounding to your account up in heaven. So Liberty, think of it this way. Every missionary that you support, every soul that comes to Christ through that ministry, every church that is started through that ministry, through your financial giving to those missionaries, you have fruit abounding to your account up in heaven. You're going to meet souls someday from, from Thailand, from, from Africa that you do not know. But they're going to come up to you and they're going to say, because you gave to missions, you were able to propel that missionary to take the loving story of Jesus to my homeland. And I trusted in him as Savior. And that missionary could not have gotten there without you. We ask for you to pray. We ask for you to promise. And third and lastly, participate in the Great Commission here as well as globally. Take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the darkness in New Jersey. Take it to all the communities that you all are able to touch in this part of New Jersey. Take the loving story of Jesus Christ that sets the captive free to them because they need what you have. They need what we have. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the precious blood of Christ that is going to set them free from their sin. They need what you have to continue to participate in the Great Commission locally as well as globally. If you have any questions concerning uh, our ministry, uh, we have a table in the back as soon as you all head out after service, and we have uh, prayer cards as well uh, for you to remember us. Uh, any form of contact is on uh, the back for it, uh, but we would appreciate if you take one, and we appreciate any questions you have, and we'd love to stay in contact uh, with folks that we have met across the United States because we want to know how you're doing. We want to know how God is moving in your life. And it's, it's just a blessing to be able to stay in contact with uh, brethren in Christ because uh, we're family. Even though we just met a lot of you all yesterday and today, that doesn't matter because we're saved by the blood of Christ and that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we love to stay up to date with you all as well. Open your Bibles this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 this morning, if you have uh, your copy of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, we see that Paul is talking uh, to the Ephesians at this time. And uh, Paul is honestly one of, the, one of the amazing examples we can use in Scripture concerning missions. Uh, obviously, Jesus would be the best example because uh, he was the greatest missionary that we saw in Scripture. But uh, the Apostle Paul is uh, one of the bigger examples we can use in Scripture when we talk about uh, missions. And obviously today the message is going to be centered around missions because, well, y'all invited a missionary to come today, so that's what's going to happen. We're going to talk about missions. But uh, missions is vital. It's the heartbeat of Christianity because in Old Testament time, God entrusted Israel to share the love of God with all the ends of the earth, to be the light of the world for all the ends of the earth. Now the torch has been passed to the church today to take the gospel of Jesus Christ locally and globally. So missions is vital. Missions is vital to us as Christians. It is important to us as Christians. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 through 17, we're going to see proof of that. Uh, let me read it real quick. It says, uh, in verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever uh, doth make manifest is light. And then he says, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, and wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray and then we'll dive into this together today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for your loving grace and mercy. 
And God, as we uh, bow to you in prayer, Lord, it's, uh, it was my desire to come in here today expecting to hear from you. I may be the speaker behind this holy uh, pulpit, but Lord, we need to hear from you. Enough of me, let's hear from you. Lord, we invite you to speak to us today, and God, I pray and ask that each and every one of us this morning have uh, come with that intention for you to speak, for you to prick our hearts, for us to take action on whatever you tell us to do today. Lord, I pray that if there's one that does not know you as Savior, God, may they come to you before it's eternally too late. Lord, I pray that we open our hearts to you today, that we open our ears to you today, and that we apply what you have for us. And may we be doers of the word and not just hearers only. We love you. We thank you for all it is that you do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now throughout this message, I like to bring this candle. I think it's a soy wax candle, if that matters to any ladies in here. It's a mahogany and driftwood scented candle. Isn't that special? I got this from Dollar General. Can you believe that? Dollar General sells awesome candles, by the way. Um, But I'm going to light this candle if my... Uh, lighter will work. There we go. We're not burning essence to the Lord, just lighting a candle. And um, what I want to do this morning, I'm going to need someone very responsible. And you, you look pretty responsible. Is he responsible? He's very responsible. What's your name? What is it? Kristen? Kristen? Oh, hey, praise the Lord. That's ironic. <laughs> anyway, Kristen. Kristen. Huh? Oh, okay. Well, awesome. Well, nice to meet you, man. So this is what I need you to do, okay? Your job is to make sure the light in Liberty Church does not go out. As soon as it goes out, I just need you to raise my hand so I can light it again, okay? That's all I need you to do. Can you do that? Okay, you look responsible. You've got a job, too. You want to know what your job is? If you accept it, your job is to make sure he does his job. Can you do that? You got it. Okay. Okay. So you, you are the watcher of the light man, and the light man, you need to make sure the lights are on in Liberty Church, okay? Otherwise, we got some bills to pay. All right. So we're going to put this light, um, we'll put it right here, because knowing me, I'll probably knock it over It's on the, if it's on the floor, and then the pastor will never have my family back here again, because the church would have caught on fire. <laughs> but um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 through 17, let me give you some startling statistics uh, that we see in the world today. Uh, Some statistics I want to go through. As of 2001, it was recorded, and this is uh, is counting all denominations of the faith. It's counting uh, the Baptist, the Presbyterian. It's counting the Church of Christ. It's also counting the Catholic. It's counting the Jehovah's Witness. It's counting the Mormons. Any Christian denomination, anyone that proclaims that they are a Christian, they are counted in this group. But as of 2001, in all of these Christian groups, it was recorded that there was an estimated 1,135,000 missionaries, not just in America serving, but also globally. 1,135,000. Watch this. Out of all those Christian denominations that I listed, like I said, including Jehovah's Witness, Catholicism, and Mormonism as well, In 2021, 20 years later, it was recorded that that number went from 1,135,000 to now only 430,000. The experts say that it's estimated from that point to now that there's going to be over 12,000 missionaries that leave the field yearly. And watch this. They leave it for preventable reasons. Well, what do you mean by preventable reasons? Well, if you're persecuted and you lose your head in the Middle East, that's obviously an unpreventable reason. A preventable reason would be burnout, would be nobody came to help, nobody was praying for them, nobody was financially supporting them. Preventable reasons uh, could be simply that uh, the family was fighting internally and nobody cared to reach out to them to help them. 
These are preventable reasons that the book of James says that we can carry one another's burdens. These are preventable reasons, but sadly, from this point on, from, 20, from 2001 to now, they are estimating that 12,000 missionaries from all denominations of the Christian faith, 12,000 missionaries are going to leave the field yearly. Going further, there's a study that shows, shows that 50% of those that go into ministry, not just pastors, I'm talking about worship leaders, I'm talking about youth pastors, I'm talking about any sort of full-time ministry. Any sort of full-time ministry, it is recorded that 50% of ministers that start will leave in five years. If I were to invite 10 Bible students going to a university up here today, the experts say that five out of ten of them are not going to be doing this in five more years. Further on, it says that um, we will see 4,000 new churches start all across the world, not just America, all across the world. But then in response to that, 7,000 will close their doors, leaving a 3,000 church decrease. The Christian Chronicle says that there's fewer going into ministry and there's fewer going in the ministry for lots of reasons, but uh, the main reason they find is that fewer men and women are going in the ministry, not because God has stopped calling. He always calls. He's the same today as he was yesterday. No, they're simply not going in because they want money, because secular jobs are more important. Now, now don't get me wrong. If God is leading you to be a nurse or, or a police officer, or, or any sort of secular job. There's nothing wrong with that if God is leading you to it. But what we're seeing in Christianity today, and, and let me be careful of how I say this because I want it to be taken well, but what we're seeing in Christianity today, to sum it up, is Western civilization is playing a negative role on Christian culture today. Let me explain that. Like I said, it's okay to seek a secular job if the Lord is leading, but what is not okay, what is not okay is when the American dream outweighs the God-given commission to Christianity. What we're seeing today is that the 401k is put on the front runner and sharing the gospel is in the rear of your mirror. Having the, the nice car, having the nice home, having all the things of the world that we want, having whatever collection that we are given to, uh, being the most athletically inclined or the most musically inclined, being the best uh, artist, whatever it may be, all these materialism things seem to be on the front runner and sharing the story that changed our lives is put in the rearview mirror. Well, Corey, how can you say there's proof of that? Well, we just read the statistics. The statistics prove that Western civilization culture, the American dream culture, is outweighing the God-given commission. Well, Corey, what do we do? I believe your pastor would agree with me on this, but, but typically when we see that someone is a Christian, and maybe they're at the point to where they're not growing closer to Christ the way they used to, a term for that would be backsliding. So in response, a lot of times as Christians, we say, God, we need a revival. So would it not be a shameful thing? It, it's not shameful, but shouldn't we see with our eyes that if sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is decreasing as the world goes on, shouldn't we need a Great Commission revival? Don't we need a revival where Christians step up, step up to the plate, get in the batter's box, and say, God, we need to hear from you again? God, we need to get serious about you again? God, we need to take the gospel to the highways and the byways like we did in the past, 
What the church did in the first century, sharing the gospel consistently and effectively, where, as, where have we as Christians stopped that? Why have we suddenly as Christians stopped that? Now, now don't get me wrong. I, I know there are still Christians doing that, but the statistics say it's not happening the way it used to. So why as Christians today has it decreased? Folks, I want to give us a challenge today through Ephesians 5, 13 through 17. We need a Great Commission revival. We need a gospel-sharing revival. Will Christians will once again stand firm in their faith on the solid rock Jesus Christ and say once more, let me tell you the story about Jesus that changed my life. It could certainly change your life as well. And so I believe the way we can experience this Great Commission revival, this gospel-sharing revival, is through three uh, steps in Scripture that we're going to look at. I believe these three steps in Scripture, uh, when we hear them, but most importantly, take action on them, I believe we'll, we will truly experience that Great Commission, that gospel-sharing revival. And so this first step we need to see, is my candle still lit, by the way? You're a good light watcher, I'm telling you what. He's pretty good. And you're making sure he does the job. You're doing good too. This first step we need to see in Scripture is first and foremost, we must recognize it. We must recognize the need. Look at verses, uh, verse 17 with me. It says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, in general, we could say that the, the will of the Lord would be uh, pretty simple to understand. It would be for God's name to be glorified and for all the world to come to know his son is his savior. That's a pretty simple will, for God to be glorified, for all to come to know him as savior. But in mission specifically, through this application, what we need to see is the will of the Lord is for all true born-again Christians to take the gospel of Jesus Christ locally and globally. That's the will of the Lord concerning missions. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says this. It says, To go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then he says after that, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I, Jesus, have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And we get a, get a good Christian amen after that. That's the will of the Lord concerning missions for the church, for the Christian individual to rise up, to share our faith once more, to take the light to the darkness, to not be afraid to do it. Even if the government says it's not okay anymore. Last time I checked in the book of Acts, the disciples said and saw to the Pharisees and Sadducees, hey, you may be telling us not to speak the name of Jesus, but we're going to speak the name of Jesus. We're not going to stop. The name of Jesus can set the captive free. The name of Jesus takes the chains off of the filthy sinner. The blood of Jesus can wash anybody clean. Mark 16, 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every human. Every human in the world needs to hear this. Of the 8 billion plus that are encompassed in this world, and over 5 billion of them, as they say, that do not know Christ as their Savior, folks, there are plenty of souls, plenty of souls that are on their way to a devil's hell. And we have the story that can change their life. But before we do it, we must recognize it. We must recognize the need. The second step we need to see this morning, the second step we must recognize it, uh, but in the second step we must redeem it. We must redeem it. Uh, working backwards now, look at verse uh, 15 and 16 with me in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. And then uh, the apostle Paul with uh, God's inspiration says this. It says, Redeeming the time redeeming the time because the days are evil redeeming the time because the days are evil if the apostle paul was talking about this 2000 years ago where christians the first century christians need to redeem the time and sharing the gospel because the days are evil how much precious and how much challenging is this verse in today's culture folks we are living in a time of evil we 
Let me just give you an example for Toronto. You, you saw the man by the name of Amir Fassad. He's going through something called the MAID program. What that means, it stands for medical assistance and dying. It means that if you're at the age of 18 or older in Canada and you have the desire to take your life for any reasoning at all, the government will come alongside you and help you take your life for you. And Amir Fassad is going through that. You saw the news interview. You saw when the woman said, are you afraid to die? And he said, who isn't? Who isn't? Not only do you see a, a theme of loss of hope, but you see a theme that the days are evil. The days are evil. We are living in a time, Christian, where your faith, our faith is wrong and sin is right. Christians, we're living in a time of age where our brothers and sisters in Christ are all across the globe, especially in freedom-suppressed regions, where if they even speak the name of Christ, their head is gone. Living in days of evil. But what does Jesus tell us to do in response to that? Redeem the time. Redeem the time. Because in this dark world we live in, doesn't it make sense for the light to be brighter than ever before? There's a, there's a song that I grew up uh, listening to when I was a kid. Uh, my Sunday school teachers taught me it, as a matter of fact. And a lot of you will probably remember it, but you all remember the song that goes, hide it under a bushel? No? I'm going to let it shine? Folks, we're seeing in Christianity today where a lot of Christians are allowing the bushel to hide the light of the world. And sadly, in the days of evil that we live in, we cannot allow this bushel to hide the light. We've got to let the light of the world shine for all to see. We got to let the lighthouse be seen. We got to let this, this light that has been given to us, which is Christ our Savior, we must, we must take the light to those in the darkness. They say that a candle like this, if you put it in a totally uh, dark space, you could use midnight as example. If you put it in a totally dark space where clouds are covering the moon, they say and estimate that you could see this candle more than three football fields away with your light. Shouldn't the lost world see the light in our heart beating in this dark time that we live in? But sadly, today they're not. Because many Christians today, they've got the light, but they've got their bushel on it. We must recognize it. We must redeem it. And third and lastly, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14 tells us we must reveal it. We must reveal it. Verse 13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Another good word to use for manifest would be to reveal. So, so but all things that are reproved are uh, made manifest or uh, are revealed by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest or whatsoever is uh, revealed is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Folks, I've heard this term before, but when we look at the lost world today and we see that they're acting in sin, a lot of Christians get mad at it, and I, I, I totally get that, but we need to remember the lost world is not going to act like Christians if they don't have the light of the world in them. The only thing they know to do is to follow sin because that's right in their eyes, and it was right in your eyes before too. It was right in my eyes before, too. How can we expect the lost world to be more Christ-like? How can we expect the world to sin less if we're not revealing the gospel of Jesus Christ to them? We must reveal, we must make manifest the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to be honest this morning. I would not trust the public school system to tell my kids who Jesus is. I would not trust the government to tell my kids who Jesus is. Because Jesus gets distorted a lot of times in the public school and in the government's eyes. I would trust my kids to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ, to hear who Jesus truly is from a true born-again Christian. 
That's who I would trust my kids to hear the gospel from. But folks, if we don't reveal who Jesus is, then the only option left to hear about Jesus is to hear what the lost world thinks about Jesus. If the church is not going to reveal who Christ is, the question is who's going to? Who's going to? Remember, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is given to the church. The Great Commission, the duty to share the gospel is given to the church. God did not entrust our government with it. God did not entrust the school with it. God did not entrust Walmart with it. God entrusted his church with it. So if we're not willing to take it, the question is who will? We must recognize it, we must reveal it, or we must redeem it. And third and lastly, we must reveal it. Before I ask you to bow your heads and uh, keep your eyes closed before the invitation, I appreciate my, my light watcher today, and I appreciate my light watcher's boss today. You all did a great job. The light's still going, so I don't have to fire you. You can keep that light watcher job. Folks, I mentioned earlier in the message that this light represents Liberty Church, Okay. This is the heartbeat of Liberty Church. This is the heartbeat of you all. My question is this. Will we take the light to those that are lost in the darkness? Will we take the light to those that need it most? Will we take this precious light to those who are engulfed in their sin, to those who are in bondage, to their sin? Will we take it to our neighbors that we know they are engulfed in sin? Will we take it to our family, our co-workers that we know do not know Christ as their Savior and we know what's going to happen to them when they die someday? Will we take this precious light to them? Or will we allow Satan to blow it out? There's a lot of churches today They've allowed Satan to get a hold of the light, and Satan has blown it out. Liberty Church, with heads bowed and eyes closed, heads bowed and eyes closed, as I light your light again, during this time of invitation, and I I appreciated what uh, the leadership team did this morning before the services, but your leadership team, if you know it or not, before the services start, They have this tradition of getting on their knees to God and praying and expecting God to move. It's so important that they're getting on their knees because do you know what that tells God? It tells God that we are in submission to him. We are in submission to him. We are getting on our hands and knees, begging and pleading to a mighty God, entering his throne room, the King of kings and Lord of lords, asking him to move in each and every one of our hearts. So as we come to the invitation time, with these altars open or with the seat as your altar, this morning, if God spoke to you concerning giving to missions, concerning getting the gospel locally as well as globally, or maybe maybe God spoke to you concerning sharing the gospel locally or taking the gospel globally, If God spoke to your heart today for any rhyme or reason, folks, get it settled now. Come to the altar today on your hands and knees in submission to a mighty God. Take the first step of obedience, and that first step of obedience is to simply recognize it. Recognize what we need to do. And then once we recognize it, let's redeem it, take the action on it, and then let's reveal it. Let's reveal it. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you came in here today. Maybe it could be your first time. Maybe you've been coming for a while. And maybe, maybe you know in your heart, you know deep down in your heart, you do not have the light of the world in there. You could look down in the deep crevices of your heart and all you see is total darkness. Maybe you've come in here today and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're in here today and you do not know 
the Savior of the world. Let me tell you, there's a God that loves you. He cares for you. And the proof of that, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to take your sin away. He rose from the dead three days later in victory. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't know Christ as your Savior today, the Bible says, today is the appointed time of salvation. You can come to know Christ today. You can be freed from your sin. You do not have to be identified in your sin any longer. The world may call you a porn addict. The world may call you any other sinful thing under the sun. The world may recognize you as a murderer or a hateful man or woman, whatever it is. They may recognize you as a liar, cheater, stealer, whatever it is. But when you come to Christ as Savior, you are identified in the name of God. You're identified in the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ today, How about you change your identity now? We love to show you in the Bible how you could be saved. Because the love of Christ is free and open to all.